And every morning at 6 a.m., it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Good afternoon and welcome. This is Real Britain with me, Emily Carver, on your TV, radio and online. This afternoon, we'll be taking a look at law and order. How do we restore it in Britain? And there's nothing more British than a fish and chips shop. But sadly, they, like many cornerstones of our high street, are at risk of going bust with all the rising costs. I'll be joined in the studio all afternoon by the director of the New Culture Forum, Peter Whittle. They're excited to get his thoughts on everything that's going on. But first, it's the news with Polly Middlehurst. Good afternoon. Just after two o'clock, I'm Polly Middlehurst in the GB newsroom with the latest. The Chancellor has warned middle-income earners could be among those struggling to pay their energy bills this winter. Nadim Zahawi says he's concerned about people who aren't on benefits, telling the Daily Telegraph newspaper those earning around £45,000 a year may need government support. That comes after Ofgem announced an 80% hike in the energy price cap to over £3,500 from October. The cost of living crisis will be a priority for the next Prime Minister and the Conservative MP Robert Halfen told GB News Rishi Sunak has the best track record. I do believe that his track record shows that when it counts, he does help with the uh, cost of living. The government spent £37 billion. Pounds. It's a huge amount of money, especially with the current spending pressures, um, to try and help people over the next uh, few, few, few months. He acted properly when times were tough. If we didn't have the furlough scheme, my constituents would have become destitute. Our businesses would have closed. But the policy director for the Centre for Social Justice, Joe Shalam, believes the current support package doesn't go far enough. What we've been doing at the Centre for Social Justice is looking at the hit to uh, incomes, uh, particularly those on low incomes, over the autumn and winter period. And what we found is that even when taking into account the uh, existing support package, which is hugely welcome in, in so many ways, we're still seeing considerable falls in, in the real incomes uh, of, of those who are already struggling, frankly. Where we are now is a very, very different picture to where we were when that cal the calculations were made about what needed to go into that package. And it's really urgent that we, that we update our cost of living policy response. Well, in other news today, police are saying silence is not an option as they appeal for more information on the shooting of Olivia Pratt-Corbell in Liverpool. The nine-year-old was killed in her own home on Monday night. A second man is being now questioned after being arrested on suspicion of murder yesterday. Police also released a video showing another arrest with a 36-year-old man from the Heighton area detained on Thursday. And they're urging the public to come forward with names to help with the investigation. Three years after he was killed in a crash, the family of Harry Dunn say they miss him terribly. A memorial ride has been staged today at the US Embassy in London to mark the third anniversary of his death. The 19-year-old was killed when his motorbike collided with a car which was allegedly being driven on the wrong side of the road. American Anne Sakoulas was charged with causing death by dangerous driving but was allowed to leave the country because she had diplomatic immunity. His friend Zach Veltkamp says the fight for justice continues. It's almost gone from from the in initial sadness to being pulled along and strung and continuously pulled out, so the sadness continues. Uh, and it's almost like, when? When is it going to happen? Moving forward, I think there will be more protests. We will continue. We won't go silently. And we won't let it, let it be swept away. Harry Dunn's friend. Now, the government has announced a £56 billion plan to crack down on sewage spills. 
Under the proposals, water companies in the UK will face tough targets to minimise pollution. That's after dozens of warnings were issued for beaches and swimming spots across England and Wales last week, following heavy rain that overwhelmed sewage systems. Motorists are facing traffic chaos during this bank holiday weekend. The AA issuing an amber warning with an estimated 15 million trips expected over the next couple of days. It's only the second time the AA has issued that alert, indicating heavy traffic congestion. And its president, Edmund King, shared his advice for those setting off today. Prepare your car, check out things like your tyre pressures, your windscreen wiper fluid, uh, your oil, check that all out. Check your route. You know, you can get alternative routes. And one thing we're also saying, we find at the AA, when people break down, almost 40% of people don't really know where they are. A car once owned by Princess Diana is expected to fetch more than £100,000 at auction today. The black Ford Escort RS Turbo was driven by the Princess from 1985 to 1988. Last June, another Ford Escort used by Diana sold for £52,000. Silverstone, Silverstone Auctions rather says the RS Turbo Series 1 was usually made in white, but at the time the Royal Family Police Guard asked for Diana's to be painted black for reasons of discretion. That's it. You're up to date on GB News. More news as it happens. Now back to Real Britain with Emily Carver. Welcome to Real Britain with me, Emily Carver. So here's what's coming up on the show. Four people have been killed this week in Liverpool, including a nine-year-old girl who was shot in her home. Social media has been awash with videos of crime on our streets late lately. I'm sure you've seen them all. It's horrific. I'll be asking, how do we restore much needed law and order in Britain? And so, the energy regulator increased the price cap on household bills by 80%. The average bill will rise to £3,549 per year from October, and it's expected to rise even further after that. The Chancellor, Nadhim Suhawi, has warned middle earners, as well as low earners, are likely to need government help to pay their energy bills. The former CEO of Energy UK, Angela Knight, joins us to break down the figures. And the great British fish and chip shop is at risk of going bust with the rising cost of energy, cod, potatoes, sunflower oil. Our chippies need a little bit of help. We will also be solving the palaver with me, Emily Carver. Your views are much more important than mine, of course, so I'd love to know your thoughts throughout the show. How should the government tackle the energy crisis? Can they tackle it? What can they do? Tweet me at GB News or you can email me on GBviews at gbnews.uk. Of course, you can also watch online and on YouTube. Thank you for watching. So it's a beautiful day, at least here in uh, Paddington. The bank holiday has begun, the sun is shining, preparations are taking place for the Notting Hill Carnival, and millions of families are preparing for the new school term. It's hard to believe on a day like this, we're about to face a winter of misery. We know the news, the energy price gap is rising, our bills are set to skyrocket. At the same time, the cost of everything else is rising, isn't it? From food to rents, haircuts to mortgage payments, it's going to be one hell of a squeeze and not just for those at the bottom. For ordinary, hard-working people up and down the country, family with families with mortgages, those who budget, who save, who try to do the right thing, they risk being ignored. At the same time, the cost of everything else is rising. As I said before, it's foods, it's rent, it's haircuts, it's mortgage payment. It's going to be a big squeeze for all of us. And there we go, we're going on and on. Our um, auto cue is messed up, but we're going to move on. What I'm trying to say is that we're not just talking about those, we're not just talking about the rich who will be hit by this. We're not just talk, sorry, we're not just talking about the poor who are going to be hit by this. For ordinary hardworking people up and down the country, those who do the right thing, they risk being ignored by the government. I'm not talking about those at the top who may have to give up their third holiday of the year to Florence or the French Alps. I'm talking about those on decent wages. 
those who will be unable to balance their budgets. Some are saying now that the squeeze could be worse than the 70s. France is preparing its citizens for a total cut-off of Russian gas. They're warning that public lights may have to be switched off at night. Germany has set out plans to limit the use of lighting and heating in public buildings. Meanwhile, our country seemingly is stuck in a state of limbo. We're waiting for the Conservative Party to finally elect a leader. Of course, some of us warned that ousting a prime minister at a time of crisis was probably not the best course of action. Now the very same people who worked so hard to oust him are the same ones complaining that no action is being taken. But here we are. I can't complain now. We can't turn back the clock. It would be wrong to say the government is doing nothing. The government is shelling out the cash. £400 is going to all bill payers. Households on means-tested benefits and pensioners could receive up to £1,200. Small and medium-sized businesses, however, which employ 60% of us, may face closure without support. That's what we're being warned. Both Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss have suggested they will not only cut taxes on energy bills, but they'll increase support for those who most need it. The focus of our political establishment is, now understandably, on those who need the help most. But I need to think we need to start thinking about the squeezed middle. The middle earners, those who go to work, who see their pay slips slashed in half by the HMRC, who do the best by their children. Nadim Sahawi, the Chancellor, to his credit, has at least given those people a mention. He's acknowledged that people earning around £45,000 a year will struggle too. I bet his horses are shivering at the prospect of a cold winter. These are the people, the majority of the country, whose disposable income will take a mega hit. The people who keep our economy going. If you're rich, you'll be able to pay. If you're poor, you'll be receiving considerable payments from the state. To the next Prime Minister, I say, ignore the middle at your peril. At the very least, with Labour 14 points ahead in some of the polls, your votes depend on it. <laughs> now, moving on. This week, the nation has been rocked by violent crime. Four people have been killed in Liverpool, including nine-year-old Olivia Pratt-Corbell, who was shot in her own Home. Former Metropolitan Police Detective Chief Inspector Mike Neville has said police are at a watershed moment and need to stop the dancing, the Macarena, and start taking the prevention of crime seriously because people are living in fear. Shouldn't the police be there to make us feel safe on the streets fundamentally? So I'm asking, how do we restore law and order in this country. It's getting out of control, in my view. Something needs to be done. So to, to discuss this, I am joined by Norman Brennan, a retired police officer of 31 years, founder of Protect the Protectors and the director of Law & Order Foundation. We also have Donna Jones, Police and Crime Commissioner for Hampshire. Now, Norman, do you accept that premise that we've lost law and order on our streets? Yes, I do. Uh, policing have lost the streets of Britain. Uh, about 10 years ago, uh, under this government, under Theresa May, reduced the police service by just under 22,000. The Metropolitan Police Office, uh, Service lost just under 4,000. Um, and what happened was we also lost 44,000 backroom staff, which meant that the, the remaining officers were filling in for the officers that we lost and also the backroom staff. It meant that the communities lost their community police officers. Victims of crime were not treated um, like they once were when they phoned 999 or asked for police assistance. And as a result of that, the community and frontline policing became disengaged. And what happened was then, we certainly got violence on the street from certain elements in society that were carrying knives and guns and behaving antisocially. And when the public phoned the police, they didn't turn up or if they didn't turn up they didn't turn up quick enough and even when the public or victims reported their crimes their crimes were binned almost immediately many were not told of what was happening apart from here's your crime number and they were speaking to their family friends and neighbors and saying the police have given up on us the police haven't but there are circumstances that the police are in, like dealing with mental health issues, and often at uh, hospitals, you've got as many police cars waiting in the car park as you've got ambulances looking after 
people in the community that other agencies can't cope with either. Now, Norman, you talk about you talk about resources there, but what about priorities? Do you think the police have got it right when it comes to priorities? Because I do think the public do see the police getting involved in so many, uh, what would you call them, woke initiatives, dancing in the streets and so on, um, you know, non-crime non hate incidents and so on, uh, t policing Twitter. Have they got their priorities right? No, they haven't. Uh, they've got them completely wrong. Look, I live in an era where some people call me a dinosaur or some old fart in the olden days. Well, it was never perfect in the olden days, but when the public phoned the police, we turned up. I can promise you this. There was really a police officer in Britain that couldn't wait for the next 999 call to put on our blue lights and get there. And often we get there in numbers. We challenged those that were committing crime, frightening the public, and the public thought, thank goodness, that's the police we want. What, poli what the police service has turned into is dancing, not all of them, believe you me, these are certain sections or certain elements, but sadly get all the publicity. They're mm. dancing with dozens of other police officers singing YMCA. If these officers are all in uniform and hundreds of thousands, if not millions of members of the public that have been victims of crime or have been failed by the police are saying, my God, they've got time to be happy and gay, but they haven't got time to answer my call, attend my home, take a statement, investigate the crime and patrol the streets. You wear one uniform, one colour and you keep to your oath without fear or favour and you remain completely impartial. That, I'm afraid, and I'm ashamed to say in policing, who I've loved and been part of for 43 years, has changed the focus on policing and how we protect the public. And by God, they're certainly telling us how dissatisfied they are with us. They've almost given up on us. We haven't given up, given up on them, but it's down yeah. to police leaders and police chiefs to tell the public the truth, apologise to them, tell them why we can't cope and how we can cope better by being honest with them and sharing the truth with them rather than hiding behind their closed doors and just letting frontline police officers get all the slack from the public and victims of crime and sadly yeah. some elements of the mainstream media. Yeah, Donna, I think uh, luckily for most people, they aren't impacted by violent crime in their day-to-day -day lives. That is not their central focus. But for a lot of people in this country, they do feel like criminals are in, untouchable at the moment in terms of burglaries, in terms of thefts, in terms of antisocial behaviour. Those are the crimes that impact people every day. I mean, my parents just had their car stolen out of their drive last night, um, for goodness sake. And I don't imagine that they have too much hope of that crime being solved. I mean, the statistics do speak for themselves. Uh, you know, the clear up rate for theft is, is just 4%, 1% for stolen cars. Donna, what's going wrong here? Well, I, I agree with the points that Norman's just made there about policing priorities and about them not being aligned to what the public want. As a police and crime commissioner and the national lead for victims, my job is to be standing up for people like your parents. And I'm very sorry to hear that, Emily. That is that is a, a horrible crime to happen to somebody. Uh, you know, from my perspective, the police are, the you know, Norman has just said, police officers, they join the force, they want to go to that 909 call, they want to catch the burglars, they want to make sure they're helping to lock up serious, violent, dangerous criminals. Now, with a new Prime Minister coming in, there is an opportunity here through a new Home Secretary or through the existing Home Secretary, if she remains in post, to be able to send a clear message to police, uh, to Chief Constables and Police Commissioners, but particularly to Chief Constables who command their forces, that if you want to go and do the Macarena or YMCA, if you want to be painting police cars with rainbows and everything else, because you feel that your force uh, perhaps is not as connected to the LGBTQ plus community or to other, other parts of society, if you do that, you need to make sure you're getting the bread and butter done first. You need to make sure you're getting to the burglaries. You need to make sure that you're dealing with the robberies. You need to make sure that you're dealing with the non-domestic break-ins as well as the domestic ones. And actually, at the moment, UK policing is not doing that. So, yes, we do need to get back to basics. But I just want to say in a little bit of defence here for the police, they are responding to the same as 
other parts of um, government organisations have also been a real change in, in, a, in a social push over the last few years, which has particularly come from, you know, organisations such as, um, you know, BLM and from LGBT uh, plus communities who've really found their voice on social media, who've really found their voice in, in, the, in the printed and online uh, media such as this. And because of that, the police have been responding to and they're getting written to by the Home Office, Chief Constables Monthly, tell us what your BAME recruitment is, tell us what you're yeah. doing to be an, a, you know, a diverse um, employer. So they're trying to do what they think is right. Now, I do think the lines have become very blurred indeed. I do think that with policing, without having enough police officers, as Norman has already said, you have to focus on the core business first. And if I was your parents and I woke up this morning and my car had been stolen and then I went onto social media and I saw some of my police officers from my police force doing the YMCA or the Macarena, I would be very, very offended by that. And I think the public have a right to be offended by that. So I do hope with the new uh, Prime Minister coming in, some of the, the blurred lines can be perhaps made a lot clearer. Um, and I do think it's a wake up call. You said in your opening bit here, watershed moment for policing, for chief constables to really focus on the core business and make sure that that is done first, because that's essentially why we pay our taxes to them. Yeah, Norman, just to finish, I think that's very true. I do worry that when we're talking about the police and we're, we look at these reports of the police doing things like Darcy and the Macarena, turning up to Pride all flamboyantly and so on, that we can't be seen to bash the police too much because at the end of the day, we need the police service. I think but perhaps it should go back to being called the police force um, in terms of the respect that that might um, project. But I do think that we don't want to bash police officers too much because we need them and we don't want them to leave the force fundamentally absolutely they're leaving their droves look i lock horns with people like donna and chief officer groups but i've done it for 10 years ago i used to do it very friendly i even dm some of them and the rest of it to try and say look you guys and girls have really got to stand up for frontline officers go out defend us uh, even when we when people have had a pop at us defend us and then uh, admit that we've made mistakes and tell the public what we're going to get right and just a caveat the mainstream media Put the chief police aside because I'm happy to sit down and work with them, by golly I am, for the better and the safer of society. But let's also look at mainstream media. They must stop just reporting all the dreadful things that police officers do because, mm. by golly, they're far away by the good things. And the caveat to that is this. We stopped uh, apparently an, an athlete uh, a couple of weeks ago on the M40 absolutely legitimately. The independent police complaints have dropped it. It's a non-complaint. But that hit all the headline news about how dreadful the police were for doing their job. And guess what was happening on the streets just around where he was stopped? Young black children were being stabbed and shot and maimed, not a murmur in the media, and police officers were there on their knees, not to any section of the community, but trying to save their lives. The mainstream media must play their part. If you incite anger and hatred to the police because they've got huge huge sort of coverage and sway throughout all communities, they will turn some that were never anti-police into anti-police because they only hear one story. Donna and all the other PCCs and chief constables, please come out with all of us, admit where we make mistakes, but tell the public how brave police officers are 24 hours of the day, because the last word is, the police are the public, the public are the police. If they don't work together, it's the law of the jungle. I don't want to see that, and I'm sure Donna doesn't, and nor does millions of members of the public and victims of crime. Well, that's true, isn't it, Donna? Just very quickly, just to finish uh, this discussion, we need to back the police fundamentally, don't we? Yeah, well, I'm the one that started doing that first today. I'm the one that's come out and said it's not actually their fault. They joined the police force because they want to catch baddies. They want to catch bandits. They want to lock them up. They want to get them into prison. I'm the one that's saying there's blurred lines. And those blurred lines, I think, are coming perhaps from the government with the, the, the pressure and the, the sorts of um, statistics and, and the numbers they're asking from police forces every week and every month. Collectively, it sends a message to chief constables that the government is very focused on a certain area. Um, actually, they Re started to rechange those lines over the last couple of months. They're now very much focused on burglary. They're very much focused on homicide levels. They're asking about, you know, drug related and the 10 year drug strategy, which the previous policing minister, Kit Malthouse, launched. I was there at the drug conference uh, where, when he launched that in Westminster. And, you know, I do think that there is an opportunity, like I say, 
Home Office, uh, Number 10, working together, getting those lines drawn very clearly. PCCs have a role to play here in supporting government ministers, making it clear what the public do and don't want. Um, and I think I've made that point today. But my defence of particularly police officers that work for me uh, in Hampshire and the Isle of Wight and under my chief constable is that they are simply doing what they are asked to do. And given a choice, they'd go and catch a burglar every single day of the week, as Norman's already said. Thank you very much for putting that passionate case forward. Thank you, Donna, and thank you, Norman. Norman, that was a retired police officer and the director of the Law and Order Foundation, and Donna Jones, who is the Police and Crime Commissioner for Hampshire. Very, uh, thank you very much for joining us in that discussion. Peter, may I just very, very quickly ask your response to that? Do you think the police are hard done by? Uh, no, I don't. I don't. And I'm afraid I'm a bit harsher than your guests. Um, <clears throat> we're talking a lot about the LGBT thing and dancing, and, mm. of course, that's crazy. And it does make people lose confidence in the police. Far more important, I think, is the way in which they now seem to feel that they can police people's thoughts. That yes. is a far more serious thing. We've had very well-publicised cases lately, you know, where they turned up to arrest a man and, and, and basically... Over a Facebook post. Over a fa Facebook post. And the whole point was, oh, well, uh, what the explanation was that uh, you caused someone anxiety or something. This is very, very worrying. Uh, we but are this si is the fault of our legislation, is it not? The Equality not, Act and so on and really, so forth. Not really. Not completely. I mean, I think that the police have pretty much been captured by woke ideology. I mean, of, of, so have all of our institutions. But I think in the case of the police, it becomes very visible, of course, because they're on the front line. Um, I think that it's all very well saying we should support the police, but we are in, I think, a crisis of policing where, what was it, something like 80% of, of police had not made an arrest. There was this extraordinary uh, statistic recently. The mess in London is in special measures. Mm. I mean, I think that this is a crisis. It's not good enough just to say, yes, but ultimately they do the right thing. I yes, think that I they mean, are... we don't need to be policing tweets if we can't even solve basic burglaries. That's the bread and butter of the police. I think you're right. Anyway, we must move on. There is plenty more to come this afternoon on Real Britain. Next, we'll be discussing the energy price gap. It's increased by a whopping 80%. That means the average bill will rise to £3,549 from October. But first, let's go to the weather. So looking ahead to this afternoon in the UK is looking showery for many with some bright or sunny spells in between showers. Let's take a look at the detail. Starting off in northern Scotland, there's going to be a few showers around, but these will be fairly scattered. Western parts of Scotland may perhaps have a few showers and some sunshine. Far eastern parts of Northern Ireland should still be largely fine around mid-afternoon. Further west, the cloud will be spilling in with a little rain. Scattered showers developing across the northwest of England. Most of those light, although watch out for some heavier bursts as well and sunny spells between those showers. A scattering of showers likely too over Wales, although there will be a little less in the way of frequent. Still the chance of a few heavy showers, most likely over the hills. And similar for the Mid Midlands, sunny outbreaks there and quite pleasant in the sunshine. Further east, around the Midlands, we can expect those temperatures in the mid-20s and it will feel pleasant as well when it's not raining. And looking around in Scotland, there'll be a few showers around, but those fairly scattered western parts of the area, a few showers with more sunshine later on. You're looking at Northern Ireland now, largely fine around mid-afternoon. The weather further west where the cloud is spilling in with a little rain. And that's the outlook for Saturday. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints were over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farrow. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7pm for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panellists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. 
See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back to Real Britain with me, Emily Carver. Now, we've been asking today for you to solve the palaver with Carver, me. And that palaver is, of course, our energy bill crisis. Now, the energy regulator Ofgem, you've heard this many times before. We know that the cap is going to reach £3,549. That's the average bill from the 1st of October. That's an 80% increase. Now, our economic editor, Liam Halligan, has a brilliant explainer on the reasons behind the price hike. Watch now. The government says it's working flat out to develop options to help cash-strapped households after this weekend's announcement of Ofgem's new energy price cap. Chancellor Nadim Zahawi acknowledges that Friday's news of an 80% rise in average household energy bills from October will cause stress and anxiety for many people. But he puts the blame elsewhere. Putin will continue to use energy as a weapon as a way of getting back at us uh, for the help we're putting into Ukraine. We need to remain resilient. We need to make sure that this isn't a sticking plaster that for the long term. We continue to help the most vulnerable who have no, no cushion. And that's what I'm determined to do. And we're working up those options for both households and for business for the incoming prime minister on the 5th September. Six months of war in Ukraine have indeed pushed up wholesale gas prices as Russia's restricted supplies to countries assisting Kiev. As the Kremlin's turned the screw, Western European nations have been stockpiling gas ahead of winter, pushing up prices even more. Regulator Ofgem caps what energy companies can charge households for gas and electricity. Until last October, that cap was around £1,200 a year. In April, it rose to almost £2,000, but has now soared to over £3,500. So average household fuel bills from October will be almost three times higher than a year ago. Back in May, ministers announced all households will receive a £400 annual rebate on their energy bills. And certain more vulnerable families already on benefits may qualify for another £650 of targeted assistance. But the government faces criticism that since Boris Johnson resigned as Tory leader in July, the ongoing race to succeed him has been a diversion. Energy campaigners have told me a far more comprehensive support package should already have been in place, ahead of this higher off-gem price cap. We haven't got a new government. It's the same party. That really, it is absolutely shocking. It's a dereliction of duty to have sat on your hands and to watch this this come kind of crashing uh, towards us. I think, look, the urgent issue is to provide immediate support to people on the lowest income. That could be doubling the package that we had in May uh, from then Chancellor Sunak to match the new reality. It could be even more than that. I think that's a no brainer. As summer ends, we face an autumn and winter of sky high utility bills. Ministers will unveil more help but only once a fresh Prime Minister emerges and a new government's formed after September the 5th. Any assistance package, though, will only partially ease, rather than fully offset, the pain of spiralling energy costs on cash-strapped households and the broader economy. 
There we go. That was Liam delivering us an explainer on those rising energy bills. It doesn't seem like we as a country can even agree on why energy bills are so high, let alone how we can solve that crisis. But please do let me know what you think. How can we get those energy bills down and where should that help go? We'll get your thoughts later in the show, so please do send them to me at GB News or to GBviews at GBnews.uk. You're with GB News on radio, TV and online. Next, we'll be discussing fish and chip shops. They're under threat, apparently, with the rise of cost of living, the price of energy, sunflower oil, cod, it's all going up. Now it's time, before that, to check on the news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. Thanks, Emily. The headlines, the Chancellor has warned middle-income earners could struggle to pay their energy bills this winter, saying he's concerned about those who aren't on benefits. Speaking to the Daily Telegraph, Nadim Zahawi said people earning around £45,000 a year may need government support. That comes after Ofgem announced an 80% hike in the energy price cap to over £3,500 from October. Police investigating the murder of nine-year-old Olivia Pratt-Corbell in Liverpool say silence is not an option. They're appealing now for more help from the public after they released a video showing a man being arrested in the Heighton area on suspicion of murder. A second man who was detained yesterday is also being questioned. In London, a memorial ride is being held at the US Embassy, marking the third anniversary of the death of Harry Dunn. The 19-year-old was killed when his motorbike collided with a car, which was allegedly being driven on the wrong side of the road. American Anne Sekoulas was charged with causing death by dangerous driving, but was allowed to leave the country because she had diplomatic immunity. Harry's family say they still miss him terribly. And motorists are facing traffic chaos this bank holiday, with the AA issuing an amber alert for the weekend. An estimated 15 million extra trips are expected over the next couple of days. It's only the second time ever the AA has issued such an alert, indicating extreme traffic congestion. And a car, once owned by Princess Diana, is expected to fetch more than £100,000 at auction. The black Ford Escort RS Turbo was ridden, driven rather, by the Princess from 1985 to 1988. Silverstone Auction saying the RS Turbo Series 1 was usually made in a white paint colour, but the Royal Family Police Guard at the time asked for Diana's to be painted black for reasons of discretion. That's it. You're up to date on TV, online and on radio as well. This is GB News. Don't go anywhere. Emily is back in a moment. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farrow. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7pm for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panellists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship 
and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wharton tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back to Real Britain with me, Emily Carver. Now, lots of you have been getting in touch today about political policing. Robert has quite a lot to say. He says, my late brother was head of several police forces as well as head of corruption in Hong Kong for 11 years. Wow. And I know he wouldn't recognise modern policing. Positive discrimination is a very large part of the blame as well as weak policing culture and feeble sentencing. It needs a radical overhaul with accountability reintroducing in addition to harsher targets. Peter, yep. harsher targets, is that what we need? Well, I don't think we should be thinking in terms of targets. I mean, what we need, really, I mean, is in some ways what the, the gentleman there sort of said in a way is that the whole of our law enforcement establishment has been infused with a kind of liberal approach, right? It doesn't, on the whole, it just doesn't like punishment very much. Um, <clears throat> that sort of makes its way in some ways down to the police. But I think the overriding thing is that over the past few years, we've seen police taking the knee at BLM protests. We've seen a kind of um, dancing around with Extinction Rebellion, whilst at the same time, not just at some festival, they've actually been basically bringing London to a halt. And they've still been doing that. And I think that there is this sense, I certainly, when I was on the London Assembly dealing mm. with policing, um, I got the f sense that there was a kind of selective way in which things were policed. Some uh, protests were considered to be better protests than others. Yeah, I mean, it was very obvious where their politics lay in that respect. Yes, exactly. it, they were very much in support of Extinction Rebellion. Do you think there's any argument to say that they're trying to build connections with communities well, and no... understand the people's priorities? Uh, do you think there's anything in that? Well, I don't think That's they what should... they would argue. They, they should not be influenced by... Because uh, the lady earlier said this... Uh, you know, they should not be influenced by or trying to build, you know, uh, connections and relationships with Extinction Rebellion, particularly <laughs> if they're acting in uh, an illegal way or an obstructing way. Similarly with BLM, it is not the case that the police should take any form mm. of side in something like that. That did huge amounts of damage. But I think our ministers are equally to blame in that respect because they, of course, were meeting with representatives of Extinction Rebellion at that time. I think it was even Michael Gove or perhaps another minister who talked favourably of Greta Thunberg, who, of course, is leading the charge on, on all this, or was at the time, at least. So I do think they are conflicted. I don't know whether uh, in, they're in, in some ways. No, I, I, possibly. There is a kind of overall weakness now. I think you had it right at the beginning mm. when you said perhaps there should be a police force and not a police service. I think that they are seen as being more political now, and that's because they are, first of all. And secondly, to go back to my original point, they are also seen now as being uh, social engineers. So in some ways, they, they, they have more of an eye on what you're writing online uh, than they do on everyday crime. And, I mean, the statistics actually show that. Look... I grew up respecting the police, uh, you know... Fearing the police, is that what's gone fear, wrong? But not There's in a, no fear. Not, not in a kind of European way of fearing the police. Um, you know, police have always had uh, a, a wonderful uh, relationship, really, on the whole, mm. traditionally, with the British public. And that's all down to the way that Robert Peel started it. But that has gone now. Um, and I I've, don't look to them myself for protection. I do think that a lot of criminals do feel untouchable. I, I mentioned, that, mentioned that earlier when we were speaking to the commissioner there and the former police officer. You know, if criminals know that they're going to get away with basic crimes, then there's no respect left, well, is there? No exa fear. Exactly. Well, you know, just very recently we've had two uh, clips on Twitter, um, of a McDonald's being done over in Nottingham, for example. Mm. Same thing happened in Oxford Street. The police were there on Oxford Street, but just around the edges, nothing seems to happen. I mean, those were extraordinary scenes that we saw on Oxford Street. Essentially, children uh, rampaging down the street, looting, 
businesses on the side of the roads. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. Anyway, we must move on now. After a difficult week at work, for some people, there is nothing better than a fish and chip supper to raise your spirits. But could Britain's fish and chip shops be on borrowed time? There are concerns our beloved chippies face extinction due to the rising price of cod, sunflower oil and, of course, energy. So what needs to be done, what can be done to help them through the cost of living crisis? I'm delighted to say I am joined by John Pagani, who owns Cafe Royal in Anan. Hi, John. So what challenges are you Hello. facing? Yeah. Is your fish and chip shop going to stay open? It definitely will stay open. We've been here in Annan uh, frying fresh fish since 1967, and it really is uh, the heart and soul of the community here in Annan. Um, there have never been challenges like this prior to this. Even COVID, we managed to get through without being too battered, but uh, this is going to be the challenge of a lifetime preparing for the huge rise in energy bills coming your way because of course you don't have the same support that uh you know it, uh, families on on the bread line have you know you don't have those income support packages coming from the government how are you preparing yeah well we're a limited company and uh, we missed out on furlough so we didn't get any help during the COVID crisis and once again we've been missed out we don't have a, an energy price cap on for businesses we're paying VAT on our energy. We're paying VAT on our income. Uh, unlike some who manage to avoid paying VAT, the system is most definitely um, geared to uh, really hit hospitality very hard. And that's something that the government needs to address as a matter of urgency. It's not just the energy uh, crisis at the moment. It's also to do with the fact that the VAT system just simply is not fit for purpose in a modern world. And in terms of labour shortages, are you suffering any labour shortages? Are you finding it easy to recruit or do you have people that have been working there since day dot? We have quite a few of the stalwarts that have been here since uh, well, for many years, four or five that have been here more than 10 years. So, uh, yeah, they're the heart and soul of the company, and it's the people that uh, the customers like to see as well. However, getting new members of staff, we do have a problem with that. Um, a lot of the younger people coming up, people that are still, you know, do at college or uh, late years of school, they're, they're really quite keen, and some of them are just the best staff we have. Uh, however, getting people to come in and take uh, jobs, even flexible working, is quite difficult. Now, how are, you gonna, how are you going to make sure that you continue to make a profit so you can pay your staff and keep your business going? Are you going to have to make your portions smaller? Are you going to have to market yourselves far and wide much more than you were before? How are you going to keep that business rolling in when people's, uh, people's purses are tightened? Our plan, yeah, our plan is to keep going. So. Uh, we are not looking to make huge profits. It's always been tight margins in the fish and chip industry, but with the price of fish the way it is, uh, and everything from packaging to, I mean, we drive electric cars to, to deliver our fish and chips, so petrol doesn't have much of an effect on us, but the electricity has gone up now. So we thought we were smart, and now we're, uh, we're paying for more for the electric. However, um, profit margins will just have to be extremely tight. Our profits will be lower and we'll pay less tax, you know, uh, but we are certainly, uh, our aim is to keep going. This can't go on forever and we're hoping that uh, when things settle down around the world, as prices start to come down, we'll be then be able to um, move forward and, and perhaps get a little bit more profit then. Well, I hope your business is, has every success in the future and rides this particular I wave after that. the Thank pandemic. You. It's all going on. Would you like to just give a shout out to your, to your chippy? Where are you? Yeah, it's the we're the Cafe Royal in Annan in southwest Scotland. Been here since 1967, frying fresh fish, fresh from the sea. OK, well, I'll, short, I'll be sure to pop by if I'm ever in southwest Scotland. Thank you very you'll, much for joining you'll us. You'll be made very welcome. Made <laughs> Thank, very you, welcome. Thank you, John. That was, of course, John Pagani, who owns a fish and chip shop in southwest Scotland. Thank you very much. So, moving on, a government spokesperson on this very 
issue has said we are clo working closely with industry to mitigate the impact of our sanctions against Russia, what they may have on British businesses, including the creation of the £100 million UK seafood fund. We're already supporting businesses, the government says, of all sizes by slashing fuel duty, introducing a 50% business rates relief for ele eligible high street businesses and putting the brakes on bill increases by freezing the business rates multiplier worth 4.6 billion over the next five years. I love it how they always add up all the individual help to some massive number, but of course that's only a little bit of help for everyone, but money can only go so far. Anyway, we are moving on to Brexit, or you know what we're going to be doing about Brexit come the new leadership, uh, come the new prime minister. So it's been claimed that Liz Truss is the Brexiteers' last hope as ultra-Remainers are mobilising to take us back into the EU. In The Telegraph this week, the journalist Alistair Heath, who always writes very punchy and often miserable articles, he said that their strategy, strategy is to blame Brexit for almost all the myriad of difficulties that Britain currently faces. I mean, that's certainly true. And portraying problems that are entirely unrelated to the European question as vote leave broken promises. So is Brexit really on the brink or is Alistair exaggerating there? So to discuss this, I'm delighted to be joined by former Brexit Party MEP and friend of the programme, Ben Habib. Ben, is <laughs> Alistair being a bit... Is, is, he, is he exaggerating there? Is he being a bit OTT? Is Brexit really on the brink? Well, no, I don't think Brexit is on the brink. I think the hurdle over which Remainers would have to get to get us back into the EU is vast. Mm. Remember, if we wish to go back into the EU now, we would have to adopt the euro. And that is self-evidently economic suicide. So I think the case to go back in is going to be very hard for Remainers to make, no matter how much they conflate the impact of lockdowns with Brexit. Um, you know, I don't think they're going to win that argument. Um, one of the other things Alistair he said in his article w was that Boris going was a, was a danger to Brexit. And actually, I take issue with Alistair on that, because Boris, I think, had become a problem for Brexit. He had delivered whatever he could deliver, but his deal was a bad deal. And because it was his deal, he couldn't pivot away from it. So I'm actually delighted that we're going to have a new Conservative Party leader and Prime Minister who will still have a 76-seat majority, I think, and two and a half years in which to really get to grips with properly delivering Brexit. And it's not just an ideological desire that I have that Brexit should be properly delivered. It needs to be properly delivered, for example, to help the gentleman you had on just as I was walking in, into the studio, um, you know, with his fish and chip shop yeah. in, in, in Scotland. Think about how much better our fishing industry would be if Boris Johnson had genuinely taken back control of fish like he promised he would. Yeah. Have you got a point? If you, no, no, no. Do no jump I, in. I was just going <laughs> to say, it's actually uh, ironic, isn't it, that the if the last hope is Liz Truss for Brexit, she actually was a she was a Remainer. I mean, it, that's yeah. ironic. I, I would agree with you. Um, I, I do feel that the Remainers, the hardcore people, uh, sense blood. You know, I do. I do feel that that you know that they would actually start to think of not. You know, it would be impossible almost to go back in. But I think they can do an awful lot of damage by simply being just very, very doubting all the time. I mean, we've seen that all yeah. the time. Yeah, and huge amount. Yes, I mean, Alistair Heath does say that they're, he's worried that people will start seeing being in Europe as the, the greener grass, as it were, yeah. and will start having this nostalgic memory of when things were better <laughs> in the EU. But, of course, a lot has happened in between then and now, namely a global pandemic and lockdowns for two yeah. years. So we can't really be blaming, sitting here, blaming uh, the current crises we face on, Bre Absolutely on, on not. Brexit. It would be Absolutely ridiculous. Absolutely not. And, in fact, there are two critical areas in which Brexit has been fantastic for the United Kingdom. The first of, one, the first of that is breaking away from the European Medicines Agency, you know, and if, we, if Boris hadn't done that, we wouldn't have been able to accelerate our vaccination programme, which was actually a world-beating programme, and we saved lives across the world as a result of Brexit. And the other area where 
uh, Boris initially was very keen to get a deal was on financial services. Everyone worried that you know was worried that the city would be impact, adversely impacted if we left without a deal. Mm. In the end, the EU refused to give us a deal on financial services, and the city has gone from strength to strength. No, I think you it's just pretty actually, obvious. Sorry, to... I just add yeah, there, actually, yeah. Yeah. because I remember Sadiq Khan uh, saying that the city was going to lose. Seventy half a million, half a yeah. million jobs, five hundred thousand yeah. jobs. Well, that would be the city obliterated. Well, they said, <laughs> they yeah. said ridiculous things like Frankfurt would be the new, the new London, which was just ludicrous for anyone who's ever been to Frankfurt. Not that the people of Frankfurt aren't lovely, of course, but yeah. they are no hub compared to London. But what I would say is, of course, there have been difficulties due to Brexit, not least with our imports and exports. Uh, to and from the European Union. There have been additional costs, additional administrative costs. Is this just the price we pay, Ben, for some balance here? No, I, I, don't, I don't agree with that narrative, by the way. I think Brexit, if it had been done properly, and I hope Liz will do it properly, I, well, I just want to, before I come to that, I just want to say there very is one massive, well, very quickly, there's one massive hook that Remainers have in the UK that the EU has in the UK, which is the Northern Ireland Protocol. It doesn't just affect Northern Ireland, it's a hook into the entire United Kingdom. And they may use that to prevent the UK from genuinely deviating fr away from EU regulations, deregulating and doing what's in the national interest. So we really have to watch that. But actually, one of the great benefits benefits of Brexiting was to put right the economic imbalance between the German manufacturing machine that was exporting a phenomenal amount to the UK, effectively at an artificially reduced exchange rate, because the euro was an, uh, is the wrong currency for, the, for Germany. It should have a much stronger Deutschmark. And, you know, so we were running a £100 billion deficit with the EU because of that artificially uh, weak euro and the German manufacturing machine. And the trade imbalance that that created was a massive pressure for sterling. And Brexiting was the opportunity to put that right. So if we properly Brexit, if Liz Truss has the confidence to ditch Boris's awful deal, really get us out from the EU, we can do a hell of a lot more, like the city, like our medicine sector. I do wonder if we <laughs> have enough time before the general election for the Conservatives to get to grip with the, grips with this. And of course, everything else, but at least there's the positive case that Ben has put forward for Brexit and for how we can transform this country into, I imagine, a low-tax, low-regulation utopia of sorts. That is it. Free market <laughs> utopia. Anyway, we must move on. The government has published, moving to a stinkier subject, the government has published its plan to reduce, reduce sewage discharges into England's rivers and the sea and is promising the strictest targets Ever. The plan requires water firms to invest £56 billion over 25 years on improving infrastructure. It comes, of course, after pollution warnings were in place on nearly 50 beaches last week after heavy rainfall led to water companies discharging untreated sewage into the water. However, the Liberal Democrats, of course, have described it as flimsy and a cruel joke. I am joined now by water quality campaigner and former lead singer of The Undertones, Fiergal Sharkey. Hello, Fiergal. Thank you for joining me. Now, is this a new problem that we face in our rivers and our sea? Um, you know, it's obviously been all over the headlines recently, but is this something that's been building up for a while? Um, it is something that's actually been illegal for almost 30 years. And in fact, since privatisation of the water industry um, in 2012, the European Commission took the UK government to the Court of Justice and the court ruled that what was going on in the UK, water companies being allowed to discharge sewage into our rivers, was illegal, save for exceptional situations. To give your viewers a little context, over the last two years, we now know water companies have spent almost six million hours on over 775,000 separate occasions dumping sewage into the environment. I'm afraid government's response to this is, quite frankly, a shambles. It um, is, in my personal opinion, probably the greatest act of violence I'll see committed against the environment, certainly in my lifetime. And Figa, why are they dumping this sewage now? Is the problem that we're producing more sewage than we were before, no, no. rising population, etc. our infrastructure just isn't there? The simple fact of life is what you're seeing is a physical manifestation of 30 years of underinvestment by the industry, 30 years of profiteering by the industry, 30 years of regulatory failure, 
and three decades of a complete vacuum when it came to the political oversight. By way of example, uh, water companies have paid out over £72 billion in dividends to their shareholders. Off what the regulator has confirmed in public, we as bill payers have already paid water companies all of the funding necessary to live up to their legal expectations over the last 30 years. They haven't done that. When you have a situation where salaries for bonuses for chief executives are now measured in multiples of millions, shareholder bonuses or shareholder dividends in multiples of billions, and what we've ended up with is a situation where government have now effectively legalized the idea of it pays to pollute. Water okay, companies no, what can now makes, legally pollute our rivers think, for at least 28 years. You, but, but sorry to interrupt you, but what makes you think that right. nationalizing the water companies would Im, Im, improve things? What would improve by nationalizing? Because surely it would be huge amounts of money that's needed to improve this infrastructure. Surely the regulator just needs to have sharper teeth. Um, well, personally, I never mentioned the word nationalizing. Um, that is a debate going on, but it's not. I think you're right for the moment. What needs to be looked at is the regulation of what has had the power, as has the Secretary of State, to fix this this afternoon with the stroke of a pen. Legally, since 1991, they can issue a thing called an enforcement order. That's a legal compliance that the water companies must adhere to. And any failure to not comply with that order, the Secretary of State or the regulator can then fine water companies up to 10% of their annual turnover. Now, I agree with you. Taking 10% of those companies' annual turnover, might that sharpen a few boardroom minds? I suspect it would. Thank you very much for joining me, Phil Girl, to talk about the horrendous sewage that is seeping being, while well, being dumped in our rivers and seas. Thank you very much. That was, of course, water quality campaigner and also musician, Phil Girl. Sharky, you're watching Real Britain with me, Emily Carver. We're just about to go to a break. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back to Real Britain with me, Emily Carver. I'm, of course, sitting in for Darren Grimes, who's off on holiday in Dubai with his mother, I think. He's taking her for a treat. Anyway, this afternoon, we're, of course, on TV, radio and online. Now, this hour, we'll be talking about the French, specifically our relationship with France. Are they a friend or a foe? Of course, this comes after Foreign Secretary Liz Truss joked that the jury is still out on Macron. 
and I'll be joined by the director of the New Culture Forum, Peter Wettel, of course. But before we get stuck in, it's the news with Polly Middlehurst. Thanks very much, Emily. The top story this hour, the Chancellor has warned middle-income earners could be among those struggling to pay their energy bills this winter. Nadim Zahawi says he's concerned about people who aren't on benefits, telling the Daily Telegraph those earning around £45,000 a year may need government support. That comes after Ofgem announced an 80% hike in the energy price cap to over £3,500 from October. The cost of living crisis will be a priority for the next Prime Minister and the Conservative MP Robert Halfen told GB News Rishi Sunak has a proven track record. I do believe that his track record shows that when it counts he does help with the uh, cost of living. The government spent £37 billion, it's a huge amount of money, especially with the current spending pressures, um, to try and help people over the next uh, few, few, few months. He, acted properly when times were tough. If we didn't have the furlough scheme, my constituents would have become destitute. Our businesses would have closed. Policy director of the Centre for Social Justice, Joe Shalam, believes the current support package doesn't go far enough. What we've been doing at the Centre for Social Justice is looking at the hit to uh, incomes, uh, particularly those on low incomes, over the autumn and winter period. And what we found is that even when taking into account the uh, existing support package, which is hugely welcome in, in so many ways, we're still seeing considerable falls in, in the real incomes uh, of, of those who are already struggling, frankly. Where we are now is a very, very different picture to where we were when that cal the calculations were made about what needed to go into that package. And it's really urgent that we, that we update our cost of living policy response. In other news today, police are saying silence isn't an option as they appeal for more information from the public on the shooting of Olivia Pratt-Corbell in Liverpool. The nine-year-old was killed in her home on Monday evening. A second man is being questioned after being arrested on suspicion of murder yesterday. Police have also released a video of a man being arrested, 36 years old, in the Highton area on Thursday. They're urging the public to come forward if they can help with any names. The Metropolitan Police will be investigated following the death of a man in Kingston in south-west London. Officers were in the process of making an arrest following an allegation of theft when he entered the River Thames last night. His body was recovered two hours later. Police say he wasn't in handcuffs. The incident has been referred to the Independent Office for Police Conduct. And three years after he was killed in a car crash, the family of Harry Dunn say they'll miss him terribly. A memorial ride has been staged at the US Embassy in London today to mark the third anniversary of his death. The 19-year-old was killed when his motorbike collided with a car which was allegedly being driven on the wrong side of the road. American Anne Sekoulas was charged with causing death by dangerous driving but was allowed to leave the country because she had diplomatic immunity. Harry's friend, Zach Veltkamp, says the fight for justice continues. It's almost gone from, from the in, initial sadness to being pulled along and strung and continuously pulled out, so the sadness continues. Uh, and it's almost like, when? When is it going to happen? Moving forward, I think there will be more protests. We will continue. We won't go silently and we won't let it, let it be swept away. The government's announced a £56 billion plan to crack down on sewage spills. Under the proposals, water companies in the UK will face tough targets to minimise pollution. That's after dozens of warnings were issued for beaches and swimming spots across England and Wales last week following heavy rain that overwhelmed sewage systems. That's the breaking news. In the last couple of minutes, a car once owned by Princess Diana has sold at auction for £650,000. The black Ford Escort RS Turbo, which was driven by Diana between 1985 and 1988, was initially expected to fetch around £100,000. Silverstone Auctions says the RS Turbo Series 1 was usually made in white, but the Royal Family Police Guard at the time had asked for Diana's to be painted black for reasons of discretion. A record price. You're with GB News. More news as it happens. Now back to Emily.
Thank you, Polly. Welcome back to Real Britain with me, Emily Carver. So, here's what's coming up in the next hour. Our Foreign Secretary, Liz Truss, has joked that the jury is out on whether or not the French are friends or allies. In response, French President Emmanuel Macron said Britain is a friendly nation in spite of its leaders. We'll get stuck into our relationship, stuck into our relationship with France in just one moment. Also coming up, the Royal Mail went on strike yesterday over pay. They're doing it again on Wednesday, again over pay. Do you have sympathy for the mail workers? Have you noticed that they've gone on strike? And the other Conservative leadership contender, Liz Truss, says she'll divert billions from NHS into stricken social care services. We'll talk to the National Care Association and a care home owner to talk about what financial support our care sector really needs. Now, don't forget before 4pm, we'll be solving today's palaver with me, Emily Carver. Your views are much more important than mine, of course. I'd love to know your thoughts on all of those topics and how should the government tackle the energy crisis. Let me know what you think. Do you think they can do anything? Do you think, think they should be renationalizing energy or giving us more payments into our pocket, freezing energy bills, more windfall taxes? What do you think? Let me know. Tweet me at GB News or you can email me on GBviews at GBnews.uk or should they scrap net zero? Is that the problem we've got? Anyway, you can watch us online too on YouTube. Don't forget Facebook. You'll find lots of brilliant content there on the GB News page and you can get involved in the discussion. Anyway, thank you very much for tuning in. Now, the French and the English. Are we frenemies? It's been a given that France and Britain are rivals and have been so for centuries. But since the 1904 Entente Cordiale, that's my French accent, the rivalry seems to be more of a question of competition than conflict. Step in, Conservative leadership hopeful Liz Truss. She's muddied the waters, apparently, so by saying the jury is still out on whether Fa French President Emmanuel Macron is either a friend or a foe. In response, he said that Britain was a friendly country, regardless of its leaders and sometimes in spite of its leaders. A nice little dig there. This comes in a week where France accused Britain of withholding £8 million to fund beach patrols to stop channel crossings from France. Now, joining me to discuss this in the studio is border control expert Henry Bolton and also former Labour MP and Minister of State for Europe, Dennis McShane. Now, Henry, is this just a little bit of banter between the French and the English? I mean, Liz Truss. She said the jury's out. That was reported in the BBC and elsewhere as being a massive slight, a diplomatic mistake, was it? Or should we just see it as a bit of a bit of banter? Uh, you know, it's a bit of banter as well as uh, a serious issue. We've had this banter with the French for centuries and it's going to continue. But the thing is, behind the scenes, are we working together? And the problem here is that I, I actually think that we've had the wrong approach. But to address first this eight million, um, the question whether we owe them eight million or not is really ne neither here nor there, given the, the large, the huge amount of money that we've already given them. And surely, you know, what we should be looking at is the fact that Fren the French don't want these migrants any more than we do. We're trying to get rid of them. The French are trying to do the same thing. Here's an idea for the, homes, the next Home Secretary, I guess now, and for Liz Truss, and that is, why not work with the French and say to them, listen, you don't want them, we don't want them, let's work together to try to disrupt the networks that are bringing them to you, to, and let's work on that together, let's use our joint intelligence, joint operational capacities, as we did until 2006 when Tony Blair pulled the programme on it, pulled the funding on the programme, we went out there and we were kicking in doors. We were disrupting the networks, going all the way back through the Balkans and so on, and it was highly effective. Let's speak to the French and say, let's work together on this. Because we're not going to stop these people attempting to cross the channel, the channel unless we stop the flow to France. Now, Dennis, that's true, isn't it? We've given, I think it is, £80 million to the French so that they can... I hope, or at least what they're supposed to do, is stop the crossings, stop uh, migrants being able to get into dinghies and cross over to England. It doesn't seem like they're holding up their side of the bargain. Bonjour. 
Uh, je suis en France. I'm in France. <laughs> sort of family holiday. Been coming here for many, many years, and I've been living with this kind of all my life. I think, perhaps even longer than dear old Henry. Uh, no, last year, June the twenty-first, we signed a deal. You can read it in the cuttings. No secrets. Fifty-seven million pounds to France to increase and step up the border patrols here. It's quite a distance, you know. It's about fifty miles from Valois down to Dunkirk, a further hundred down to Dieppe, which is a problem. Now you imagine patrolling every access to roads to Oxford uh, between London and Oxford. Uh, it, it takes an enormous amount of Person power, man, women power, man power, and we haven't paid the bill. I mean, we agreed. It's nobody's disputing. We owe the money. So, oh, dear old pretty. I mean, maybe she needs to keep the money for herself when she's fired as Home Secretary. So, all the French were saying is, uh, look, you signed on the dotted line, pay. I mean, I'm not quarrelling with any of the points. I mean, I was there when, uh, as minister, we signed the Latouquet Treaty which meant that the border for entering Britain was in France. That is something we wanted, not the French, uh, but we insisted on it. And as a result, we've got a lot of these very difficult problems. But at the end of the day, we, we took in uh, last year 38,000 asylum seekers. About half of them are women and children. The French took in, just looking at the figures, 103,000. The Germans, 120,000. So then, this then, notion yes, that only yes. Britain has a problem is just silly. Dennis, surely, um, you know, it's, we're not talking about numbers here. We're talking about whether, firstly, are these people refugees? The answer is very clearly no. A vast number of them are not. You look at the video footage, you look at the video footage, you look at the, the country's origin, and, you, and there is nobody, and this is a fundamental point for me, there is nobody who transits the European Union to get to the North French coast with the intention to the coming to the UK unless they want to do so. And if they want to do so, it is them, it is those people as individuals who are driving their movement. It is not the situation that they find themselves in. It's, it's a matter of preference for them where they are. And Henry, oh, for heaven's sake, for heaven's sake, sake, we're all Dennis, very I'll moved, let you come back and just let Henry despite finish. Despite the conventions, surely, even if they have left a war-torn region to start with, they have become economic migrants. They are choosing. This is not... This, this shouldn't be some sort of uh, choice as to where they go, because otherwise we open our doors to probably 90 95% of the world's population that is slightly worse off than we are. Dennis, he makes a point there, doesn't he, Henry? <laughs> Look... I mean, if you're seriously saying all the Russians, and again, we're taking far fewer than in other European countries, have suddenly become economic migrants because Putin is killing and butchering and torturing them. Dennis, sorry, we ourselves... I, I don't, I don't, let me, sorry, I finish. Let Dennis finish and then Henry, 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 Henry hold that thought, Henry. Okay. Let me finish. We, we, Britain, took part in four major regime change destructions of states in the last 20 years. I was involved in them. I'm not hiding my, my part in it to some extent. Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya and Syria. And we initiated giant surges of people that none of us wanted, but far more going to our European countries. I'm not against Henry's idea of roving police patrols, but you'll have to negotiate that with the Italians and the Croatians. I think there's about seven countries between Albania and arriving here. And if you want any kind of cheap car wash, you're not going to find sturdy white sons and daughters of Harry, Henry and myself or yourself, Emily, doing it. It's lads who come in, yep, they're often under dodgy gangmaster control, who then wash our cars very cheaply. I, I, I love hang to change Hang on, hang on, hang on, Dennis, the... sorry. Have I, have I understood you? Are you advocating that we should allow boats to come over because they're, they are sturdy young men from countries where they will no, do not jobs not like not washing all, cars? What about clear. our national security? Let me be clear. Half the people... Everybody, half the people arrive uh, are, are like you, in a sense, uh, a, a woman, and my grandson next door. Well, that's not child. true. We can see well, with our own eyes. Dennis, come on, don't take us for months. We can no, see with our own pictures. eyes that it's not women and children. And the, the Everybody, largest, we see the, the pictures, the, Dennis, the pictures the on calm days the of the Zodiac. Dennis. Hang on, Dennis. Arriving. Sorry, I'm not going to let Henry reply to that because I think he's itching to come in. We talk about French. The largest group, Dennis, at the moment, is the largest nationality 
reality at the moment, or country of origin, is Albania. Mm -hmm. Albania is not at war. We have not intervened militarily in Albania. In fact, <laughs> Albania is a NATO ally. Albania is an accession process for the European Union. It's a member of the, of the Council of Europe and the <laughs> Organisation yes, of Security yes, and Cooperation yes, in Europe. Yes, yes, I don't I, want I was advisor to, to the Albanian Prime I, I Minister's don't want office. To... Dennis, uh, why, want... why are we taking these people claims for, for asylum from them? They're predominantly young men. I uh, the, the fact is that they have transited the European Union on a, because they're allowed in there into the European Union without uh, any visa for 90 days. They make their way to the North French coast and then with, they come here. They know perfectly no, well that they won't yeah. get an asylum Dennis, in the European Dennis, Union. Dennis, Dennis, Henry, Dennis, may Henry, I just put one Henry, point to you, Dennis? Dennis? You're right. Albania is not in the European Union. They can't transit. They go illegally. It's so but, easy. But, 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 I walked but, but, across. I lived in Switzerland. You can walk across the Alps just like that. We need to be realistic. Now, I can, it's a long talk, but can we talk for spend one minute, Emily? I mean, this is very interesting, and I don't disagree Go with Go on, very Emily. quickly. Uh, yeah. sorry, with Emily. Let's talk about France-UK relations. We've got our future prime minister. She called it banter. Actually, it was insulting. When the Argentinians invaded the Falklands, the first person to call up Margaret Thatcher was Francois Mitterrand, the French president, to give her all the details of the Exocet missiles. Washington at the time was trying to get us to come to an agreement, a sort of surrender to the Argentinians. We have got a difficult hundreds of years of relationship. I agree that. But it's no, when Boris Johnson says to Macron, donnez-moi un break. Ah, ha, ha. That's his cod French. You don't talk to other countries. You don't talk to but, Biden but Dennis, like that. A friendly don't nation talk... doesn't impound fishing boats. A friendly p nation doesn't threaten to, to blockade the Channel Islands. Uh, the, but, but, the but, but, have not been diplomatic please, in themselves. Please, please Henry, if, look, were, Henry, if, if the French uh, uh, were to come up with some constructive solutions as to how to solve the Channel Islands... What is the point? I, mean, I thought we were talking it, about immigration. That, that, anyway, that doesn't, it up. does not seem like we're going to agree on this one, and that's why we have these debates, I guess. People will be sitting at home and they'll make their own mind up, minds up. Thank you so much for joining me, Dennis, uh, over the video. Thank you, link. you did well putting up your, your side of the case. And thank you very much, Henry. Now, Peter, Yes. what do you make of that? <coughs> I, I do <coughs> think, Dennis, he, 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 we, I think we I... watch people coming over. We look at Ukraine, right? Mm. It is women and children who are fleeing while the men stay behind in the war-torn country. Uh, on that point, I think he's absolutely delusional. I mean, uh, uh, and Henry, I think, rightly... Um, put him in his place. Uh, it is it's quite extraordinary that anyone can still think that this is a question of asylum. It's just simply not. As you say, it is invisible. It is right there. And uh, you're fooling yourself if you think it's anything other than that. On the French question, yes, there's always been this kind of sort of strange, spiky, love-hate thing with the, with the French. I mean, going right, what, the last century, you know, they stopped us, De Gaulle yeah. stopped us going to the EU. I mean, that was a very friendly thing, actually, to do in the end. I of course, we do have to be careful. It. None of us know the exact makeup of those crossing the Channel. There will be there will be asylum uh, seekers within the people who are making that there perilous be. journey. So it just be. so happens that at the moment, they are not the vast majority are Albanians. Masses. But They're... we do have to say that, of course, there will be those who are. Uh, fleeing persecution. Well, we, ha we have to say that, yes, if you want, but, I mean, the fact is is that the vast majority, the people coming over in boats, it is not the situation, right? They're, they're not. It, they are economic migrants, they're very strong young men what? with phones, get rid of their documentation, all of this sort of thing, then disappear into... One morning. of the points that... The, the point that I wanted to make earlier, Emily, when you, you asked me to hold that thought, was that I've worked in refugee camps in the Balkans. I've worked in them. I was crisis management advisor to the Albanian prime minister when Albania suffered 400,000 refugees coming in from Kosovo. I've worked in, in Ukraine. I was there for five months as the, lead, the head of the EU's crisis response team in 2014 at the end of the Maidan and, uh, and, and afterwards. Um, I know firsthand what refugees look like. I've also worked with criminals and I've worked with economic migrants and I've interviewed both for the United Nations High Commission for Refugees doing an analysis for them. The people crossing the border now, coming across the channel, the vast, vast majority of them, whatever they say they are, Wherever they have come from, they are economic migrants. Now, I am speaking not from an academic point of view, not from a theoretical or research point of view, but I have spent years working in the field trying to address these sorts of phenomena.
these, the movements of people. And I've fought the, the criminals on the ground tactically responsible for it, in the, on their ground, including in Albania. I do... They are economic migrants. These are not refugees, and it's time the British government woke up to that. I do think a lot of people should just be open and say if they are pro-open borders, if they don't believe in the nation state as it is now, just say that, mm. instead of denying mm. the facts that we all can see. Yes, it... Anyway, we must, we have to move to the weather. I'm very sorry, okay. Peter. We'll come back to that point perhaps later. Anyway, there is plenty more to come this afternoon on Real Britain. Today, I am, of course, asking for your thoughts on the, how the government should and how can they solve the energy crisis. Keep your thoughts coming in. They're coming in thick and fast, and we'll go through them before 4 p.m. But first, let's have a look at the weather. Well, this evening, largely dry across the country with some rain across the far northwest. Let's home in now on the detail. And a dry picture across the southwest of England throughout this evening with a few sunny spells ahead of sunset. Fairly pleasant, temperatures around 20, light winds as well. Largely dry at 7 o'clock this evening across the southeast of England. Some last glimmers of sunshine ahead of darkness, perhaps an isolated light shower too. Dry across South Wales, patchy cloud in places, winds fairly light and feeling quite warm with temperatures around 22 Celsius. And mostly dry with patchy cloud across the Midlands this evening. Perhaps an isolated shower, but many places avoiding rain. Winds light, temperatures around 22 as well. And the risk of a few light showers this evening across the northeast of England, though most places will stay dry. Some sunshine ahead of nightfall, patchy cloud, temperatures around 20. And a dry end of the day with plenty of sunny spells ahead of dusk for Scotland. A low chance of the odd sharp shower, but many places avoiding that. Temperatures about 18. Across Northern Ireland, patchy rain and drizzle towards the north and west of the country, staying dry elsewhere. Winds light, temperatures about 18. So, heading into overnight, most places dry, clearer spells this evening, but that patchy rain persisting across the northwest of the UK. And that's how it's shaping up tonight. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Join me, Darren Grimes, for Real Britain every Saturday and Sunday from 2pm. A news hour that comes with a trigger warning. Scorching hot opinion with prominent guests saying the unsayable and a little bit of weekend fun thrown in. Unlike other broadcasters, I won't be forgetting what the B in our name stands for. So how are you in for Real Britain Saturday and Sunday from 2pm?
Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Now, Royal Mail postal workers have been the latest to take part in strike action, with 115,000 workers walking out over di a dispute over pay. They say the business could not cling to outdated working practices, ignoring technological advancements and pretending that COVID has not significantly changed what the public wants. From Royal Mail, that's what Royal Mail had to say. Anyway, joining me to discuss this story further is Momentum activist and Labour councillor Martin Abrams. Now, Martin, do you think these strikes are justified at this time? What are they trying to achieve? These strikes are absolutely justified because what we're seeing is, and what we've seen for over a decade now, is pay nowhere near keeping up with inflation. And now what we've got is record levels of inflation, a cost of living crisis, and workers being offered. Um, almost across the board, um, a real terms pay cut. You know, take postal workers in privatised Royal Mail, for example. They were striking yesterday. They've been offered a 2% pay rise when RPI inflation is at 12.3% and predicted to rise. The cost of uh, a first class stamp has increased by a huge amount and £400 million was paid out in dividends to shareholders over the last yeah. So in those conditions, Royal Mail workers, rail workers, uh, you know, nurses, they are all justified to stand up and say, we want a bit of a slice of that pie because we are not going to accept being poor any longer. Now, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that a 2% rise is anything other than measly. Um, we're all suffering the consequences of inflation and will be for a long time now. And of course, people's pay isn't stretching as far as it could be. But isn't the problem here, isn't one of the elephants in the room, the problem that people aren't using Royal Mail in the way that we once were? Uh, the chairman, Keith Williams, has said that their firm is losing a million pounds a day. And that's because people simply aren't sending things as much as they were, particularly during the pandemic when actually they were making money. Isn't it the truth that if wages were to go up, redundancies would have to be made? Well, listen, I'm not a spokesperson for uh, Royal Mail or the, or the trade union CWU that is representing Royal Mail workers. You know, um, it, it was the Tory government and uh, and the Lib Dems that privatised Royal Mail. And if the company that is running, you know, if, if, if the private company that is now running Royal Mail cannot function it as a business, then they should get out of the way and let the government take it back again. You know, these industries essentially should not be in private hands because uh, the service is getting worse. The cost of it is going up shareholders are getting richer, the workers are getting poorer, and now we're seeing industrial action as, as, as a result. So, you know, across the board in these, uh, in these essential sectors, public services, the private operators, whether it's rail, mail, electricity, energy, water, we've seen with sewage discharges coming out, every single one run by a private operator is failing catastrophically at the moment. And that is one now of the reasons why we're seeing a hot strike summer of action across the board at the moment. And it is absolutely essential that people on the left of the Labour Party and across the board in the Labour Party get behind these strikes and support these workers uh, who are just asking for a square deal and a decent pay rise to get them through this cost of living crisis. Well, you raise an interesting point there because, of course, Keir Starmer has come under a lot of fire, particularly from the left of the party, uh, the left of the Labour Party, for not standing up for union workers enough. And for example, not allowing his uh, shadow ministers, his cabinet, his shadow cabinet to go on picket lines and so on. Do you think Mick Lynch, who has today said that he wants strikes to go on until spring to force in quotes redistribution of wealth, is more of your type of leader? 
Well, you know, Mick Lynch is the leader of the RNT uh, union. Keir Starmer is the leader of the Labour Party. And, you know, Keir Starmer needs to essentially get off the fence. You know, the Labour Party was born out of the trade union movement. And without the trade unions, the Labour Party would simply not exist. So to have a leader that is not fully behind working people at one of the worst cost of living crises in living memory is particularly farcical, uh, in, in my opinion. And he really needs to get behind the working people of this country when we've just seen yesterday, you know, the, the absolute absurdity of the energy price cap being increased yet again to levels where it is essentially now a humanitarian crisis we are facing. And if action isn't taken, then people will lose their lives. One of the best ways to deal with a cost of living crisis is for workers to get a square deal and better pay. And if the Labour Party aren't fully behind working people, then they need to they need to essentially get off the fence and get behind working people because it is incumbent on the Labour leader to show that he supports working people at this absolute catastrophic time we're facing. Well, I think we've got to remember that there are lots of different types of working people and the vast majority of people who work, who are also working people, don't belong to unions and don't have that bargaining power. But I do agree with you that Keir Starmer needs to stop being on the fence. Of course, what he's trying to do is make himself palatable to the broader public, not just the Labour Party membership. But anyway, thank you very much for joining me. That was Martin Abrams, who is a Labour councillor. You're with GB News on TV and radio. Next, we will be discussing our care homes. Conservative leadership contender Liz Truss says she'll move billions of pounds from the NHS into social care. And we'll have a look at how much pressure the system is under. First, it's time for a check on the news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. Emily, thank you. Good afternoon to you. The top stories. The Chancellor has warned middle-income earners could struggle to pay their energy bills this winter, saying he's concerned about those who aren't on benefits. Speaking to the Daily Telegraph newspaper, Nadim Zahawi said people earning around £45,000 a year may need government support. That comes after Ofgem announced an 80% hike in the energy price cap to over £3,500 from October. Police investigating the murder of nine-year-old Olivia Pratt-Corbell in Liverpool say silence is now not an option. They're appealing for more help from the public. That's after they released a video showing a man being arrested in the Highton area of the city on suspicion of murder. A second man who was detained yesterday is also still being questioned. A memorial ride is being held today at the US Embassy in London, marking the third anniversary of the death of Harry Dunn. The 19-year-old was killed when his motorbike collided with a car which was allegedly being driven on the wrong side of the road. American Anne Sekoulis was charged with causing death by dangerous driving, but was allowed to leave the country because she had diplomatic immunity. Harry's family say they still miss him. And motorists are facing traffic chaos this bank holiday weekend. The AA, in fact, issuing an amber warning for the weekend, saying 15 million trips are expected over the next couple of days. It's only the second time the organisation has issued the alert, one which indicates severe, heavy traffic congestion. And a car once owned by Princess Diana has sold at auction for £650,000. The black Ford Escort RS Turbo, which was driven by the princess between 1985 and 1988, was initially expected to fetch around £100,000. Silverstone Auctions say the RS Turbo Series 1 was usually painted in white, but the Royal Family Police Guard at the time had asked for Diana's to be painted black for reasons of discretion. That's it. You're up to date on TV, online and on your radio via DAB+. You're with GB News. Don't go anywhere. Emily's back in just a moment. Join my show, Farage, 7pm till 8pm, Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farrow.
name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Now, one of the world's most famous street parties, the Notting Hill Carnival in London, returns this weekend after a two-year hiatus, of course, because of the coronavirus pandemic. The festival, which started back in the 60s as a celebration of Caribbean culture, is widely thought to be one of London's best-loved annual events, and it is expected to attract up to two million people people this weekend. It kicks off this afternoon with Panorama, which is the UK's biggest steel drum competition. GB News' very own Patrick Christie's is at the scene for us and he joins us now. Patrick, what's going on over there? Yes, OK, well, Emily, great show so far. Now, this is very much the calm before the storm. So you can see behind me here at Emsley Horny Place Park. That is going to play host to many, many, many steel bands. This is, of course, the UK's National Steel Band Festival. Panorama, as you rightly said. And it's kind of like the soft launch to Notting Hill Carnival. Two million people expected to rock up over the course of this long weekend. 5,000 people are going to be here in this very field in just a few hours' time. Security is starting to let people filter through. Just over there, you can start to see... Uh, all the kind of rum stalls, etc. And behind uh, some buildings just that way, steel bands are getting ready to perform. It's going to be an absolutely massive event that's set to bring around 120 million quid to the capital. I'm very pleased to be joined now. Here he is uh, by Ian Comfort, who helps to organise this festival. Hi. How are you? What can we expect from us today, then? Well, you can hopefully you expect a really good music concert from the steel bands today, I hope. And um, there'll be 80 players, 100 players in each band. And then we have about 5,000 people here. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be jam-packed full. Now, how good is it to be back after a couple of years off because of the coronavirus crisis? I think everyone's pleased we're back after coronavirus, actually. We, um, we've, we've tried to go online over the last couple of years. It's never really as good as being actually here. We did do an opening here last year, but it's really great to be back, and we expect to have a lot of people back here this weekend. Well, just talk me through exactly what's going to happen, because like I said behind me, we can see the light display starting. There was a smoke machine before. I must say, I'm getting wafts of these food stalls that are around the corner. I'm very jealous. I haven't actually eaten yet today. But what's this going to look like in just a couple of hours' time? Well, the warm-ups, we have some soccer artists, first of all, so a bit of Trinidadian music to start off with. And then the bands will come up round the back onto the stage. Each band comes and plays at each time. It's quite a long position they play and then five bands in then they're all judged then we decide who's the winner the reigning champion is mangrove steel band okay i actually saw them a bit earlier on getting set up that's correct they still hope to hold their championship okay all right fair enough and then over the course of the whole weekend so this kicks off obviously very very soon but then over the course of the weekend tomorrow and then indeed monday as well what can people expect slightly different setup isn't it opening ceremony well tomorrow is juve to start the day that's an early morning uh, walk around the block with some paint. Ah. 10 o'clock's the official opening for the Children's Day. We've got a number of bands on the street for the whole day. That'll finish at 8 o'clock. There's 35 live, live, live sound systems on the streets. And then Monday's the bigger day. So there's about 80 parading bands on that, another lot of sound systems in the whole day. A festival of kind of colour, noise, vibrancy, food, everything, isn't it? It hits all your senses, yeah. It hits all your senses. And if people are still looking at this now and thinking, how the heck do I get down here, how do they do it? 
Well, there's a bus strike in the area at the moment, so don't try coming by bus. Um, you can get the tube into Westbourne Park tube station, into Nottingham Gate tube station. Yeah. Don't try driving because you have nowhere to park. No. So use well, the camera. Nearly came a cropper with that, but he just about made it. Use your underground. Come on the underground to Notting Hill Gate, Westbourne Park, yeah. or any of the other railway stations, and walk from there. Do we need a ticket or anything? You don't need a ticket to come in on the Monday and uh, on Sunday and Monday. You need a ticket for this evening. OK, all right. Thank you very much. Well, look, I hope that you uh, guys uh, back in the studio end up having as much fun as I'm about to have. I think this is GB News' way of keeping me sober at a music festival to send me here to work. <laughs> Now, I must ask Patrick, because every time the Notting Hill Carnival is about comes to London, there are always headlines that say, you know, talk of violence and drugs and so on. I, as a teenager, was not allowed to go to Notting Hill Carnival because my parents were afraid of uh, God knows what. How are they preparing there for uh, any violence or any antisocial behaviour? No, look, absolutely. I've actually been myself here before. I must say I had a wonderful time. I've been here a couple of times. And I think sometimes some of the reports that you can get are a bit uh, over-exaggerated of any nonsense going on. But there is a lot of security here. It's a sea of people in pink vests as well. So already they're in pink, not particularly menacing. Uh, and I've been seeing police throughout as well. And I'll just throw it back to you, Ian, just quickly. Look, I mean, this is just all about good vibes, isn't it? You're not expecting any trouble or anything. No, but we, we, we want a safe, successful carnival. So therefore we do have, we've got over a thousand stewards on duty. Uh, we have the police who work very closely with us. It's a safe carnival. Yeah. Absolutely. That's very much the message that they want to get across. And I think as well, Emily, frankly, given that this has been off for a couple of years and we're all, you know, shackled to uh, in our basements, shocked, locked away because of coronavirus, I think everyone here is just hoping for a bit of a good time, really. And that certainly seems to be the vibe outside as well. First of all, I'll have to pop by uh, after the show is over. We're not that far from Notting Hill. Thank, thank you very much, Patrick. That was brilliant. Now we've got to move on to something less vibrant. Health experts have dubbed Liz Truss's plans to divert billions of pounds earmarked for the NHS to social care as robbing Peter to pay Paul. She said that too much from the annual £13 billion package committed to tackling backlogs was going to the NHS and that she would spend that on social care instead. But some have argued that this is kicking the problem down the line with squeezed NHS budgets as they are. To discuss this story, I'm delighted to be joined by Joyce Pinfield, who is a spokeswoman at the National Care Association, and Jeff Butcher, the chief executive of Blackadder Corporation Limited. Joyce, how bad is the pressure on our social care sector at the moment? Good afternoon, Emily. Thank you for having me on. The pressure on the care sector is just, it has been in crisis for many years and it is just phenom phenomenal now. And with the cost pressures that we're going to face with the utilities, of course, we are not, uh, we don't have a cap on our utility costs. So we can have costs going absolutely you know, sky high. It's very sky scary. I myself, I'm a care provider. I am trying to fix new contracts and really they are just unsustainable. So we have been facing this crisis, not only with workforce, but with funding. Local authority funded residents are really, um, very, it's very difficult to make to give a good service on the fees that local authorities will give us for our residents. It's just impossible. And this is why we want to pay our staff more. The majority of care staff are only on the national living wage or just above, simply because we're not getting the fees in to be able to pay those wages. So it's not only that the care homes themselves will be facing all of these problems, it's our staff as well our staff, how are we going to be able to ensure that we have got enough staff? Um, our staff already, we're, it's well documented that we have over 165,000 vacancies in the social care sector, and yet we're still only paying them just above national living wage or even national living wage. We need further funding. So we were amazed that eventually the uh, contestants or prime minister actually mentioned social care. We had not heard anything about social care until this week, and yet they are going to be elected at the end of next week. We want yes. to know what's going to happen to social care and the funding. Yes, Joyce, I mean, of course, you must understand, I'm sure you understand, that there are so many demands on the public purse at the moment. Do you think that Liz Truss 
was right and perhaps she was being practical when she said that perhaps money should be redirected from the NHS to social care because people end up using the NHS often because there's nowhere for them in the social care system? Of course, social care really do support the NHS. We not only prevent people from going into hospital, but we also help with the situation and freeing up beds. We're taking very complex health needs into the care service at very low rates so that we can free up the National Health Service beds so that they can mm -hmm. help with their backlog. So it's not just the NHS that requires this funding. And remember, the simple... The, uh, system is so complicated, needing so many layers of um, management to be able to move people from beds in the NHS into social care. That system really needs to be simplified and that would make a great saving. So there are some savings that could be made and that money could go into social care to help free up beds in the NHS. So it is very important to supports the social care system so that we can give a good quality service to the residents and to the people yeah. in domiciliary care that uh, we are looking after because they're very vulnerable at this stage in their in their lives. Now, Jeff, I do think that as a country, we don't value social care workers as enough as we should. I think that is true. And Joyce spells it out very persuasively there. Can you tell us, tell our viewers, what it's been like over the last two or so years for care homes? It's, it's been incredibly tough. Um, COVID was a real problem you know, to manage through. The support we got from the government was weak. Yeah, it was basically ill-informed, uh, ill-targeted and ill-guided and put our staff under very serious pressure. And we're seeing the result of that right now, Emily, yeah, with staff continuing to leave the service because they're burnt out. They don't feel well-regarded, well-respected, and they're not seen as being on parity with the NHS. Um, but I have to say, I don't think... Uh, Liz Truss's ideas are going to resolve those issues one iota. In fact, I have a horrible feeling it probably makes it worse. How will it make it worse? Well, we don't know how much of this 13 billion is going to be given when, but as you've got to suspect it will be spread over several years. But if the money goes to local authorities, which is apparently what she said in her ill-judged Hustings uh, speech, then the likelihood is with the huge backlog of people waiting to go into social care through local authorities that what local authorities will end up doing is trying to place more people rather than giving providers more money for the existing people or for new people coming in so it'll increase the pressure on providers you know, rather than put any money directly into our hands so going back to joyce yeah it's very difficult to provide a quality service for local funded authority funded resident that won't change from what i hear liz trust proposing and it has to change that's the fundamental that we cannot continue to provide these services for a few hundred pounds a week. We need more money for our existing residents on a per capita basis, and we need more money for new residents if they're going to come in. And I think the other thing is, and Joyce mentioned this, I think the staffing shortages are actually mean at the moment that there are providers who are handing back contracts and saying, we can't staff our services, therefore, no, we can't take additional people. That, the plans that Liz Truss has put on the table, if they are deemed to be called plans, yeah, don't address that issue. Thank you very much both. We'll have to move on there. But thank you very much for joining me. It seems with our ageing population, this is a subject that is not going anywhere. Anyway, we have many, many views coming in on what we've been discussing uh, today. In terms of solving my palaver with Emily Carver, uh, that has a nice ring to it, um, on how we can solve the energy crisis. Now, we have from, this is Fran, she kicked off by saying, for a start, the government can reduce VAT on gas and electricity, petrol and diesel. Secondly, they can scrap all green levies. Meanwhile, net zero can be consigned to where it belongs, the dustbin. I think a lot of people are agreeing with that at the moment. You know, we see the breakdown of costs 
in our energy bills, and quite a lot of it is what's been added by the government and could, at least theoretically, be taken away. And, Peter, just on that, do you think net zero, we talk about the supply shock from Russia, yeah. invasion of Ukraine, how much is this actually down to our decarbonisation strategy? A, a, a lot of it, I think. I, I mean, I... You know, when it comes to the general energy strategy, we are sitting on a lot of energy which we have sort of absolutely put beyond the pale. I mean, I'm, I'm a, a great believer in, in shale and, and fracking. And, um, you know, that has been literally filled in, I think, with concrete. You know, it, was, it stopped. Um, I think, you know, we should get doing that. Um, yeah. I'm talking in the broader strategy here over the next whatever, uh, 10, 20, 30 years. Yeah, and I do think it is, it's very populist and it's very popular to say, let's tax the oil and energy companies more and more and more. But if the issue that we have is a supply crisis, a squeeze on supply, then surely we need these companies to be investing in the North Sea, in fracking and so on in this country so we can have domestic security. And from what I can see, the government has been preventing that or at least disincentivizing it in this country because of their net zero targets. Just one quickly from Jim. Jim has offered us both short and long-term solutions, apparently. He said, in the short term, we should provide guarantees not to cut off supply and a payment plan. In the long term, we need to become energy independent, throttle back on net zero, build nuclear and drill, baby, drill. That's what Peter was saying. Mm. Get back to drilling. Why did we have a moratorium on fracking? If local areas are happy for it to go ahead and there are lots of jobs in it, why not just do it, mm. yeah. you know? The problem is, is we have, you know, with energy prices going up and up and up, I think more people will be saying, why don't we just dig it out of the ground here? Well, I mean, this, this, actually, this, it has come as a very rude awakening uh, because of the situation with Ukraine. Mm. Um, People have realised quite how, you know, uh, we, how much we rely on Europe. Uh, sorry, how much Europe relies on Russian yeah, energy. Yeah, exactly. That has actually become, you know, that's that was something that most people didn't even know about before, and it's sort of it's something which now obviously we've got to deal with, you know, basically for a long, a long, you know, a long-term strategy, the next fifty years. Yeah, and it, the the frustrating thing is, it is something our political leaders were warned about over on the continent, that they were too uh, reliant on Russia, who, of course, doesn't always have Europeans' best interests at heart, to say the least, um, and that we should have diversified away from that. But, alas, we are where we are. I hope that everyone sitting at home will get through the winter without... well, b with being able to pay their bills and so on. But I do fear that many will simply not be able to, and I imagine there are lots of people wondering whether the government will uh, be able to help enough to get them through the winter. Just very one last, one last um, opinion from you guys. I'm not sure who this is. Ah, this is Dave. Now, he said we should generate our own energy. It's a critical factor for our independence. So that's hydro, wave, wind, nuclear and tidal all need to be looked at. The weakness is government short-term planning. They don't care once they're out of office. And I think that's the argument, the crucial argument. We can't centrally plan our energies, energy policy, particularly when it comes to net zero. We need to, we need to let the free market you know, actually do its thing. People have brilliant ideas. Anyway, that's all we have time for today. You've been watching Real Britain with me, Emily Carver. Thank you so much for your company this afternoon. The show is, of course, on every Saturday and Sunday at 2 p.m. But for now, I'll leave you with the weather. Well, this evening, largely dry across the country with some rain across the far northwest. Let's home in now on the detail. And a dry picture across the southwest of England throughout this evening with a few sunny spells ahead of sunset. Fairly pleasant, temperatures around 20, light winds as well. Largely dry at 7 o'clock this evening across the southeast of England. Some last glimmers of sunshine ahead of darkness, perhaps an isolated light shower too. Dry across South Wales, patchy cloud in places, winds fairly light and feeling quite warm with temperatures around 22 Celsius.
and mostly dry with patchy cloud across the Midlands this evening. Perhaps an isolated shower, but many places avoiding rain. Winds light, temperatures around 22 as well. And the risk of a few light showers this evening across the northeast of England, though most places will stay dry. Some sunshine ahead of nightfall, patchy cloud, temperatures around 20. And a dry end of the day with plenty of sunny spells ahead of dusk for Scotland. A low chance of the odd sharp shower, but many places avoiding that. Temperatures about 18. Across Northern Ireland, patchy rain and drizzle towards the north and west of the country, staying dry elsewhere. Winds light, temperatures about 18. So, heading into overnight, most places dry, clearer spells this evening, but that patchy rain persisting across the northwest of the UK. And that's how it's shaping up tonight. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone.